Awesome. Thanks for having me. And hello, everyone. Um, nice to sort of virtually see you here. Um, yeah, as Jessica said, um, I'm going to run through, I have kind of, uh, I'm doing a lot of thinking about the clarinet and overtones and um, kind of a different, different ways of thinking about how we play the clarinet um, in the different registers. And so I'm going to run through these exercises um, that I'm calling unlocking overtones. Um, and if you have your instrument with you and you want to sort of play along with me, you're welcome to do that and sort of see if any questions come up. Um, or otherwise I can just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go through these different exercises and you have, uh, the sheet. Oh, Jessica, can you put the, uh, thing in the chat again? Um, but I'll be sharing my screen so you can, so you can see it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess I'll just um, jump in. And uh, as Jessica said, please feel free to type or um, jump in with any questions that you have as I'm going on. Um, so just as a, I'll share my screen so you can see the worksheet also. Um, so just as a reminder for everyone, I'm sure everyone is, you know, studying the overtone series all the time. Um, but, uh, the overtone series is, um, this sort of fundamental aspect of, um, music where if you have a fundamental tone, um, whatever frequency that is in Hertz, if you multiply it by two, then you get the octave. If you multiply it by three, you get the fifth by four, you get another octave and so on and so on. And that's how we build the overtone series, the harmonic series. It's called a lot of different things. Um, sometimes they talk about it in terms of like partials or harmonics or overtones. Um, I'm going to use them all sort of interchangeably. Um, and if someone is a professional acoustician and they want to correct me, then that's fine. But um, for our purposes, uh, it's fine for them all to be kind of interchangeable. Um, and so, you know, my approach to playing the clarinet is I want to understand the machine, the mechanism of what we're doing with the instrument um, in order to find new sounds. And also, um, I, I never want to make a sound on the clarinet that I don't understand. So if I'm playing and I squeak or some weird noise comes out of my instrument in the practice room, then I, my, uh, my goal is to then practice to do that sound on purpose so that I don't do it by accident anymore. And so a lot of these exercises come from the desire to basically just understand the mechanics and the acoustics of the instrument. So with that being said, um, the clarinet, hooray, we all love it, um, has many different registers. Um, I mean, if anyone wanted to jump in in the chat and, and share, there's my chat, I can't even see my chat. Um, so the lowest register of the clarinet is called the Shalmu, um, which is based on, you know, this er much earlier instrument. Uh, um, does anyone in the chat, like, want to posit a guess as to what the two ends of the Shalmu are, like the lowest and highest note of the Shalmu? You don't have to. You can just say no. Thanks. Uh, now, where is the chat, though? I can't see it. Yeah, oh, there it is. All right, that's fine. Uh, so no guesses, no one wants to guess. You all know, what's the lowest note on the instrument, right? Jessica knows, haha. <laughs> um, so <laughs> for me, uh, the Shalmo is the low E, right? The lowest note of the instrument. And you go all the way up until the B flat. When you so all the holes are closed up all the way to all the holes are open. That's the shallow mode. We call the throat tone G G sharp A. That's like a range in the shallow mode that we call the throat tones because it's you know starts to act differently there. Um, the clarinet when we hit the register key will overblow a twelfth as you all know. Um, so the lowest note in the clarion will also be the low B with all the holes closed. And then the thing that I've sort of come to realize only somewhat recently is that we think of the clarion as ending 
at the thumb C and then we switch to the altissimo there. But the clarion actually continues up all the way until all the holes are open. And we don't always use those and we call them fake fingering sometimes like in WC, you know, or things like that. Um, and they're not really fake, they're just less common. Um, and so the, the clarion, like I said, goes from long B all the way up to this very flat, whatever F sort of a thing that it is. Uh, then we overblow again and we get into the altissimo. Um, so this is our register key to get into the clarion. And then we have another register key. Did you all know that we have another register key? Does anyone know what the second register key is? I know you're not gonna guess, so I'll just let you think about it. And maybe someone brave will guess what the second register key is. It is this finger, right? This is the key that we open to play in the altissimo, right? Um, and uh, if you will follow my logic, although the first note of the altissimo we commonly use is this C sharp, the altissimo register is actually from all the holes closed to all the holes open. So the bottom note of the altissimo register is all, that's the actual altissimo register. Now the clarinet goes much higher than that because we can continue to overblow and overblow until we get into higher, higher partials. And some of the exercises we're doing uh, that I have in this worksheet will um, will go into that. The audio cut out, well, that's sad. Just that when you played uh, just now, we didn't hear any of the sound. Okay. So. Let me make sure. Oh, that's why. Is that better? There it goes. Yep. Okay, great. Um, let me show this again. Okay. So, yes. So the uh, the clarion is from, uh, sorry, the shalmo, all holes closed to all holes open. And then we do it again for the clarion, all holes closed, all holes open, altissimo. All holes closed, all holes open, and then we can keep overblowing and overblowing until we get higher and higher into the register. Um, and some of the altissimo fingerings that we use, um, we want to, sometimes you'll pick different altissimo fingerings because the legato is better or the response is better. And often that is because you're staying in the same partial or you're changing partials. Um, and it's maybe that you want to change partials to like help with the leap, or maybe if you want a legato, then you want to stay in the same partial. So looking at your fingering chart and trying to figure out what register your altissimo fingering is in uh, is really important so that you know why a certain fingering produces, you know, a high G, like there's four or five high G fingerings uh, because we can ac access a high G from a bunch of different lower fundamental frequencies. Um, I hope that's all clear. Please jump in if it's not clear. Um, and then I will continue on my journey uh, through this. So once you understand that the clarinet has these different registers and we have two different register keys, um, I've designed these exercises so that we become more comfortable playing in the different registers um, with or without the register key. Um, the register key is helpful, but it's um, if we rely on the register key, then um, we may not be using the right voicing. So I should have a little pause here to talk about voicing. This is something that hopefully you're all thinking about um, in your playing or in your training. I don't know who or which of you are students or professionals or whatever, whatever range you are. So voicing is this idea of basically the shape of your tongue, right? The tip of your tongue we use for articulation on the reed, the back of the tongue we use to focus the air, and then the middle of the tongue is used for voicing. And we say voicing because you're making different vowel sounds, kind of these E variants on E vowel sounds. And as I change my tongue position, um, I can produce those different overtones without using any 
fingerings. Without changing the fingering, I can play different notes. So, right? I didn't change any of my fingerings. I'm just changing my voicing by sort of moving the middle of my tongue back and forth. And I'm able to produce all those different overtones on what was basically like a, a, an A. Um, and this flexibility is really important for um, identifying the registers that you're playing in. It's really important so that you don't squeak by accident, which squeaking, of course, is just playing in the wrong partial. You know, there's a squeak isn't this chaotic, unknown thing. It's basically you were trying to play in one partial, but a different partial came out when it wasn't supposed to. Um, and it's also really important for a lot of contemporary music because a lot of techniques that you will use for contemporary music are based on manipulating overtones and manipulating your embouchure in very um, in very specific ways. And these exercises will sort of um, train your tongue to be able to do that. Um, and I'll talk about what those are um, as we go on a little bit. So I just wanted to run through some of these exercises so you can see what it is and then you can try it, try it on your own. So the first exercise, number one, is uh, for all of these exercises, the oval note head is what your fingers do and the diamond note head is what you should be hearing. So for the first one, I'm going to play a thumb C and then I'm going to finger a thumb F, but keep the C and then go back. So I'm basically removing the first register key. <laughs> see what I'm doing there um, and it's not too hard to do that at the top of the range um, but as we get lower and lower so if I don't keep my voicing um, high enough to play in the clarion then the shalmo register emerges and tries to sort of take over. So it's a good way of sort of training to make sure that you're using correct voicing to play in the clarion and not in the shalmo. Um, as you try this, probably it will feel really comfortable for the first, you know, eight or nine notes. And once you people get around to like, um, low G, G flat, it wants to start to sort of break. Um, and so as you're working on this for yourself, just see if like each time you practice, you can maintain it for a little bit longer. And then eventually you'll get to the bottom of the instrument. So that's the first one. Uh, once you feel comfortable with that, then you do number two, which is starting without the register key. Which again is pretty easy at the top of the instrument as it gets lower down. It's pretty challenging to start, you know, a long E, but have it come out to be a B. But again, you'll work on it bit by bit and you'll get more comfortable um, uh, having those notes, those notes come out. You may find as you're trying to do that one, uh, some other strange note or noise will emerge that's fine right that's just you're aiming for this partial and you're getting this partial or this partial um and in a you know on the next page you'll be doing some of that on purpose so don't fret if you're sort of like some strange sounds come out and i would say actually if some strange sounds come out that's a great opportunity for you to explore what those sounds are so if you're aiming for but instead you get well, in this context, maybe that's not what you want, but there are a lot of pieces where that sound is specifically called for. And so you may sort of stumble into some, you know, overtone multiphonics or some other techniques just sort of by accident, which is great. And a lot of these contemporary techniques for me, for my own journey, I did discover some of them by accident, just sort of like, whoa, what was that sound that I made? Oh, actually, that's a cool sound. I'm gonna sort of figure that out more. Um, <clears throat> good. Any questions so far? I'm allowing for questions. I can't actually see my chat right now. So Jessica, can you just tell me if there's a question? You're good to keep going. Okay. 
Uh, all right, so page two, number three. So this goes on for a while. So I'm gonna sort of like talk through, I only have like half an hour. So I'm gonna talk through these kind of quickly and then um, talk about extend techniques and then show the questions. So, uh, so the first one is removing the first register key. The next set of exercises are removing what I'm calling the second register key. I know it's a finger and not a key, but we, we use it as a key, it's a, it's a tone hole. So C sharp is normally this fingering, but if I put this down, I can still get a C sharp. Um, so that, you know, hopefully that is manageable. And then this one's a little strange. I'm gonna, number four, I'm gonna remove both register keys. So I'm playing C sharp with this down and this up and then I'm gonna remove both of them. It's kind of an odd feeling uh, with your fingers, but it does work. <laughs> right? Um, and again, you, you, I treat these as sort of like, they're just little like weight training exercises. There's little, you know, little, little workouts for yourself um, to work on, work on embouchure and development. So that's number four. Number five, A, is playing without the second register key. So can I play, can I jump from the clarion to the altissimo without using my finger? So normally if I play from E to C sharp, I would lift this finger. Can I do it without that? So I'm playing a, that high G just as an overblown B, which is a fingering that probably many of you are familiar with playing a high G like that. Or maybe you add some sort of keys down here to play the high G to uh, change the intonation. Uh, now we're going to do the same thing, but going down. And so there are actually, you know, multiple fingerings for that top of the staff G, right? There's two fingerings for that, which maybe you didn't know and is kind of fun for you to figure out. Uh, great, so where you can play without the second register key, now can we play with neither register key? So now instead of jumping from the clarion to the altissimo, we're jumping from the chalmo all the way to the altissimo. <laughs> changing anything in my hand it's all inside my mouth if you've been doing the other exercises this will be um, more possible for you uh, right um, good I hope you're following along uh, now we've arrived we're sort of at the halfway point this is my scale challenge. So if you are able to do all the exercises up to this point, if you want what I would consider sort of like basic proficiency in understanding the different clarinet registers, and this is what I ask all my students here at ASU to do, um, is I want you to be able to play a chromatic scale, and I don't want you to change the, without any register keys, play in all three registers of the instrument. <laughs> registers are available to me with or without the register key um, and then it's much much harder to start on the bottom note um, but it's a good challenge uh, because the farther away you get from the actual register keys it's just a little more resistant <laughs> So those are the those are the ways, and I feel like when students um, can do that, then squeaks happen less, and um, legato's easier getting in and getting across, especially the clarion to altissimo um, break is a lot easier. Um, so yeah, so that's the that's the goal there. Um, and if you thought we were done, well, of course we're not done. There's more. 
Um, so this exercise is basically finding all the overtones on a specific fundamental. So the E, you get the first over, the first one is a B, a G, and then we kind of keep going up. <laughs> Right, that's all with the same fingering, just manipulating my voicing to go up and down the overtone series. Um, probably some of you have done this um, bugle call thing where you put the instrument on your calf. Um, I'll show you just in case you haven't. If you block off most of the bell on your calf, Um, that's a fun little party trick, uh, but again, that's something that's showing you how to sort of move move your voicing uh, in the right way. So you work your way through this page and finding all the overtones. Um, and then we have these different exercises of finding the same note without the register keys. So I'm not going to do all of them, but for example, 11, I can play that G as an overblown C or as an overblown low E. They get a little out of tune towards the top, but that's okay. Um, and then this one is finding in multiple registers. Right, and on and on and on. Um, so that you can see if I want to play, if we're looking at... Um, bar 156 all those g's i can play a g like an overblown e as a overblown b flat so all the different g fingerings become available to you uh, and then the final exercise is my my own invented party trick which is a way of playing this beethoven 8 excerpt um, but with only overtones. So the normal excerpt is, right? I can do that with only moving my pinkies. Yay. Um, because all those notes are available in more than one register. And there are a couple other, I have some other silly, um, you know, things that I do just on my own when I'm, you know, having a hard time jumping between registers. Uh, I'll kind of invent little exercises like that for myself. Um, so that's the worksheet. Um, I'm going to pause for questions. I can't imagine that there are no questions, but I guess it's possible. Uh, we do have a question from a while back from Danny okay. Dorf. Um, should we expect these overtones at the 12 to be in tune? I think that that depends on the overtone and uh, which partial you're trying to reach, but uh, I'll let you speak we, on that. Yeah, we would definitely not expect them to be in tune. So the register key, in addition to helping us jump, helps correct some of the intonation um, issues. If the clarinet were like a perfect cylinder with like perfect tone holes and everything then maybe they would be in tune with the harmonic series but there's so many intricacies with the mouthpiece and it's not exactly a cylinder um so it's not a perfect you know harmonic series generator um so definitely no and especially as you go higher and higher the altissimo notes are going to be like out of tune and i would say also um you know, a Selmer versus a Buffet versus whatever is going to produce slightly different ones because the tone holes are in slightly different places. Um, so yeah, this is, we're not worrying about intonation for any of these. We're just worrying about accessing the different registers. And so this is, this is actually a question for me. I'm, I'm curious. I primarily teach middle and high school students Yeah. and um, I'm curious how to how would you go about explaining um, the oral cavity? I know that a lot of the structure is changing inside of there, but yeah. sometimes it's very challenging to explain what is happening there if they're not able to get these partials to speak uh, upon the first effort. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
usually um, one thing that I like to do with them is see if they can squeak on purpose. Like, I don't think that they necessarily need to understand what's happening there as much as I think they need to be able to generate the sound. You know what I mean? So if I can ask them to squeak on purpose, you know, and you can pick a note that would have a lot of overtones, like something in the middle of the instrument, um, then if they can, you know, they will often have access to a lot of strange sounds. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, yeah. So I think just um, the way I think about the oral cavity, like I said at the beginning, is thinking of dividing the tongue into three zones, the tip, the middle, and the back. Um, and so for this one, we're thinking about the middle and it's these different like e -a -e -a -e -a -e -a sounds, like um, variations of that. Um, you can also show they cheat by moving their jaw. Yeah. I mean, I think for this, there's no such thing as cheating because I'm really just <clears throat> interested in them uh, creating these overtones. Um, you can also show them like if you have a um, tonal energy spectrometer, you can show them how changing the vowel changes the like shape of the of the mm -hmm. spectrogram, you know, as a, and so that's sort of what we're doing. We're the shape of our tongue accentuates different overtones and that's sort of what um, produces them. I think specifically I notice with some of the younger students when they start to try to expand their range yeah. um, in, in their, you know, public schools for specifically, there's not a whole lot of time to address subtone when they're trying to go up, say above a C and hit the, the altissimo register and those notes just aren't speaking. There's not a lot of time to convey to the student what their mouth should be doing in order <laughs> and their lips specifically the amount of pressure the air the direction and speed all yeah. of those small concepts that you can kind of hit in a more um right. you know in a private lesson setting it's easier to address them but as a band director specifically it becomes a little bit more challenging to to capture each and every student's um physical you know acuity for learning those kinds of things yeah i mean uh, i'll just agree that sounds really hard <laughs> i don't know that there's <laughs> I mean, I think some of this is um, if you're really trying to build this kind of fluency, um, I don't know that there's like a shortcut, like a mm -hmm. mass shortcut, because it is really depends on what everyone's doing. Some students are biting too hard. Some students aren't, aren't using enough pressure. Mm -hmm. um, I would say 99% uh, of middle and high school students don't use enough air to play the instrument. Yeah. Um, and so that's usually my first point of thing with with younger students is just getting more air and often when you ask them to use more air sometimes they will squeak or overblow just by accident because they're not using the correct voicing and then that's a way of saying like oh cool well you're using more air and now this note came out can you like alternate between the like one you're aiming for and the one that you're not aiming for um right. So yeah, that's kind of, that's what I would probably do. I think the last question here from Kelly, um, how do you help a student who can't reach the most basic undertones? Um, yeah, um, again, it kind of depends on their sort of their age and their like relationship to the clarinet. Um, like, are you saying that like, they can't get over the break from the Shalmo into the clarion or like it's hard to it's hard to know what that what that means, um, but I'm I think not I'm not sure. Uh, Kelly, uh, they can't they can't do any of these exercises. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, I think what she's asking is there is there a starting point that is like absolute basic entry level that most most people can have success doing this thing? Is there is there a place that you would recommend to start um, when they're struggling? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, like the exercise number one, where if you just play the thumb C and remove the register key, that one works for most for most people. Um, and then you can sort of like expand that lower and lower and lower. The way that when you're learning to gliss, maybe you can only gliss like a half step and then you gliss lower and lower and lower. Um, someone asked what the hollow notes mean. So that's what the sounding pitch is. So the filled in notes are what your fingers do. And then the hollow notes are what you hear. Um, so yeah, like at the top of the page 157, I'm going to finger a D with my fingers, but that F sharp is going to come out.
So I finger between a D and a G sharp, but those two Fs come out. And how you play it is by changing what this thing that we're talking about, changing, um, changing the middle of your tongue um, so that they, they come out. Jeff, do you um, do you think it's it's easier to approach this by having them play play the actual fingering and then following up and playing the hollow fingering if they're in the right position? Yes. Yeah, and the exercises are structured that way so yeah. that they start from from something that will lead that which should be pretty successful at mm -hmm. least at the beginning of it and then they get progressively more difficult. So like these ones at the end are really for kind of advanced sort of collegiate level um, yeah. students. But the so instead, if I, I I think what he's basically saying is is try some of the earlier exercises that are kind of structured in that way, playing the note as it's written, and try to alternate between that and the hollow fingering to achieve those partials um, equally. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Removing yeah. this register key or putting this finger down when you're playing the altissimo and see if you can maintain the altissimo note without without any of the register keys open. That's like the very first step is just realizing that you don't need the register key to to play in the different registers. It just makes it easier. Um, yeah. And yeah. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Our, our next concert is getting started over on YouTube. So I'm going to go ahead and drop the link for that in the chat um, here. And Jeff, can you share with people um, contact information if they wanted to follow up with any questions that they come come up with um afterward sure. yeah just jeff at jeffanderley.com is a great way to reach me all right well i really appreciate you taking the time to share this information with us we'll make sure that everyone who um, views this in post is able to access this um great uh, exercise and we will see you all over on youtube for the next session thanks again thanks everybody